If I don't climb, life seems empty. I suppose the problem is in the end. It's addictive. And it's some people's a fatal addiction. K2. A mountain of rock, ice, storm, and abyss. It makes no attempt to sound human. It is atoms and stars. It has the nakedness of the world before the first man, or of the cindered planet after the last. Those were the words of the now past Fosco Marini, who argued this while recalling his ascent of K3, a mountain 600 meters short of K2. Fosco did not climb K2, but simply the aura and the thought of such a mountain had inspired him to say such high things about it. But don't get me wrong. K2 is not inspiration. It's a reminder that when humans try to trek in places we are not designed to go to, disaster is bound to strike. And for the people who fell to disaster in this video, there was never hope in being saved. Because the savage mountain encases and devours its victims only to spit them out decades later. K2 is the second tallest mountain next to Everest. It lies in the Kera Karum range, bordering Pakistan and China, and is about 900 miles northwest of Everest. As of today, the death rate for Mount Everest climbers is roughly 2%, but the death rate for K2 climbers is near 20%. Its high altitude, its lack of oxygen, and its rugged climbing conditions make for a dangerous climb. But by far, the most dangerous part about K2 is its instability. The path trodden a few days ago suddenly ends in a huge crack. It is constantly changing the glacier is alive on its own. So then why in the world would anyone want to climb this beast? Well, it's actually quite simple. Nowadays, all of the 14 mountains that are above 8,000 meters in height on Earth have been scaled. But 150 years ago, not a single one had even been challenged. So climbing K2 would land you as the first person to climb an 8,000 meter peak. But the real danger of K2 was realized very quickly in 1902 when a team of seven began the very first attempt to seriously climb the mountain. It eventually ended up taking the team five serious and expensive attempts to reach a peak of 6,525 meters. And after 68 days on K2, with a combination of questionable physical training among the members, personality conflicts, and poor weather conditions, the team was unlucky and failed to summit the peak. Humans had got their first taste of K2, but the disasters that would occur later into the 1900s would prove the true danger of K2. K2, a mountain that was about to claim its first victims. It was July 1939. Fritz Weisner was getting ready for his expedition to K2, a mountain that was previously monitored the year before to find a route to climb. Fritz Weisner was known as a legendary climber, someone that was claimed by many at the time to be the greatest climber in America. And after assembling a group of mostly rookies after being denied by the most qualified pros, they set off for K2. The six team members were Tony Cromwell, Dudley Wolfe, Jack Durrance, Fritz Weisner, George Sheldon, Chapel Cranmer, and George Trunch, as well as nine Sherpas, which are people that are native to mountainous areas that have extended knowledge and skills for climbing mountains. Sherpas are very valuable to explorers of the region, and they serve as guides and people that will help you at the extreme altitudes of the peaks and passes in the region. Now, after deciding on the Abruzzi route to climb the mountain, they set sail. The Abruzzi route is the easiest and most practical way to climb K2. It consists of the safest and most physically viable route. But there's one problem with the Abruzzi route that determines the fate of most climbers. It's the section near the top of the mountain called the bottleneck. The bottleneck the neck is a narrow vertical crevice which is overhung by a column of glacial ice. It is located only 400 meters below the summit and climbers have to traverse about 100 meters exposed to hanging glacial ice to pass it. And as I mentioned, the unstable nature of K2 calls for lots of heavy falling blocks of solid ice all the time. So with this in mind, most expeditions from now on would follow the Abruzzi Spur. And after getting to K2, the team was in very high spirits and started climbing up the almost nine base camps up the mountain. Weissner instantly saw himself as the lead and began as a lead climber and organizational leader pretty much the entire time. Up until base camp 4, this was not a problem. But the distance between Weisner and the rest of the group continued to farthen as the rest of the group could not keep up, and no one down below seemed to be able to be in charge of coordination. Even the better climbers such as Cranmer were seriously ill and the other great climber Durrance was significantly hindered due to not having proper boots. As they approached camp 4, the climb got harder. Between camp 4 and 6, the Abruzzi Ridge begins to sharpen and steepen with high risk of rockfall. And Unfortunately, in K2's nature, it is very exposed to heavy storms. And unfortunately for Weisner's team, they were hit directly off the bat with a big snowstorm near Camp 4. With no progress being made in the negative 3 degree storm, Cromwell and Sheldon had to be sent down for injuries. Things were looking very grim at this point. However, Weisner and the Sherpas had made significant progress tying rope higher up and pulling the rest of the group above multiple cliffs, landing the group all the way up near the base camp of the Black Tower. The others were astonished by the progress higher up on the mountain. They 
had worried that the team would not work at all, but they were very excited to see the progress of the others still going strong. But at this point, there was a serious organizational problem. Weisner, Wolf, and Pisong Lama, one of the elite Sherpas, were up at 7,700 meters getting ready for the bottleneck, believing that the others were sending supplies up to the high camps to support them. But down at the lower camps, it's not clear that they understood or really grasped the situation. But even with the lack of confidence in having supplies, Weisner, Wolf, and Pisong Lama trekked forward confident of success. The weather was perfect, but it seemed Wolf was having troubles, and it was clear he could go on no further. So he descended to the nearest base camp 8 to weigh his support. Weisner and Pisong Lama reached a point of decision. They had reached the bottleneck. They had to decide between traversing the bottleneck and be exposed to the falling ice or to take an alternate rocky climb that would ultimately be safer with the current conditions, but a climb that Pasang Lama would have a very high difficulty doing. Weisner ultimately decided on the rock climb, and they climbed rocks at an unprecedented difficulty for 9 hours straight trekking for the summit. It was now almost sunset on the top of K2 and Weisner and Pasang Lama were only 240 meters away from the summit. They were so close, but there was one problem. Pasong refused to keep going. Weisner had insisted that he wanted to travel through the night to reach the summit, but Pasong refused to do so and would refuse to dish out the rope assuming it was too dangerous. Because if they had summited now, not only would they be in a bad spot on the mountain in an area hard to climb back down at, they would be doing so in the middle of the night. Pasong knew how dangerous this would be, and it would likely end in both of them getting seriously hurt or killed. So he advocated not to summit. Being so close, it was a decision of pride versus safety, and ultimately, Weisner decided not to question his skilled Sherpa friend. Because the mountain is not a matter of pride and ego, it's a matter of skill and trust. That day, Weisner and Pasong were a hand's reach from making history. But due to the nature of the Savage Mountain K2, a hand's reach would be the difference between summiting and not. Ultimately, they climbed back down to base camp exhausted beyond belief, and Weisner regretting his decision not to go through with it himself. However, when they arrived to base camp 9, no supplies were given to the two climbers after their long trek. Nobody had cooperated at all. So they rested down at base camp 9 that set off for the summit again next morning, only to get stuck again and head back down to base camp 9 again. But still, even after that, for whatever reason at all, supplies seemed to have not been ferried up to base camp 9. Nobody was cooperating at all, none of the lower camps had done anything. Say Tendrup, one of the lower camp Sherpas, was convinced that everybody above had died. He saw avalanches, harsh weather conditions, and without care for regulation, he rashly decided that they have all perished to the conditions. And back at Camp 7, Say Tendrup persuaded the other Sherpas that everybody above had died. So, they decided to descend, leaving Weisner, Pasang Lama, and Wolf at the summit by themselves, with no supplies. And they also thought it would be helpful to clear Camps 7 and 6 as they went. Finally, Weisner and Pasong had descended down after two failed attempts at the summit, and to their absolute horror, they found Wolf, who had been sitting at the base camp all alone this entire time without any supplies since the others had never sent supplies up. He had ran out of matches, and he had no way of cooking food or even drinking water. And Weisner was furious, and couldn't understand where the reinforcements were or where they went. So they had no choice, they had to keep climbing down. So all three men went down to Camp 7. But on the way down, Wolf moved so clumsily that he had a serious fall when roped, almost sending all three of them down. This resulted in injuries around the waist for Pisong Lama and the loss of Wolf's sleeping bag. Finally reaching base camp 7 at dusk, they were met with yet again another shock. Not only were there no supplies, but the tents had collapsed under the snow. There were no mattresses and only one sleeping bag, and the food was scattered around. Luckily, there was a stove and fuel, but that was it. They had to descend even further, they had no option. But Wolf was not looking good, he was looking horrible. He moved clumsily, he needed rest, and he was out of it. So Weisner made the unfathomable decision to leave Wolf at Base Camp 7 and retrieve him later once they had supplies, thinking that Base Camp 6 would have supplies he could help him with. Weisner later said that he agreed to leave Wolf in camp at Wolf's own request, because the weather was good and Wolf had managed alone before. It is possible that after such a long time at high altitude, either or both men were not thinking clearly. Weisner and Pasong descended to more shock finding no food and no supplies at every camp on the way down, until they finally reached base camp, exhausted, unable to walk, and injured beyond belief. With no supplies for Wolf, 
Weisner was furious, accusing the others for attempted murder, threatening to sue them. Then Cromwell was appalled, and in turn accused Weisner of abandoning Wolf. Cromwell and Weisner became enemies for life. But this did not excuse the fact that one man was left up at Base Camp 7, still 7,500 meters into the sky, all alone, with no supplies, little warmth, and little hope. So thus, this began the three rescue attempts for Wolf. Rescue attempt number one started with Weisner hoping for another summit attempt after saving Wolf. This was an absurd idea, and all the other team members were strictly going up to save Wolf. Jack Durrance's party of Sherpa and Pasong Lama managed to make a trek to Camp 4. After this, Jack and the already exhausted Pasong Lama had to return back to base camp on strict orders, where all but two Sherpas had the strength to continue up the mountain and make it to Camp 6 to rest for a while. With Wolf at Camp 7, they were very close, but rescue attempt number two started with extra support leaving base camp. Some elite Sherpa Pasong Kikulu and Sering Norbu left base camp and climbed an incredible 2,100 meters all the way to Camp 6 in one day, a feat that wouldn't be achieved again for decades. Nonetheless, the Sherpa were very close to Wolf, and in the same day, Kikulu and Kitar and Finzu, the other Sherpa that had trekked to Camp 4, had luckily reached the isolated Wolf. But to everyone's surprise, Wolf was entirely apathetic, completely uninterested in showing a complete lack of concern for the situation. Wolf had been covered in his own feces and urine from being trapped in his tent waiting for multiple days for a rescue attempt. Without water and warm food for almost a week, Wolf was completely uninterested in the letters that they brought to him. And to everyone's surprise, Wolf refused to climb down the mountain, telling the Sherpa to return the next day when he was ready to go down the mountain. So the Sherpa left, but the Sherpa were stormbound in their tents with no hope of climbing back up to Wolf for almost two days. So after two days after being stuck, the Sherpa attempted the rescue for Wolf again, and trekked back up to the seventh camp on the mountain, leaving Sering Norbu behind to support. But unfortunately, this would be the last time that Dudley Wolf, Pasong Kikulu, Pasong Kitar, and Finzu were ever seen alive again. Norbu, the last Sherpa left at Camp 6, would wait a few days before descending the mountain to relay the information of all men being gone. But Weisner had thought that the Sherpa men were very capable, he was certain that they didn't perish only at Camp 7. But at this point, no one in the team had any level of physical capability left, and certainly not enough to trek all the way up to Camp 7 from the base anymore. Everybody was exhausted, but nonetheless they attempted a third rescue, in which they had made it to Camp 2 where a storm would blow in and last an entire week straight, where they would be completely blocked on the mountain. And after a week of no information, Wolf and the three Sherpa rescuers were all dead, atop the mountain of K2 forever. To this day, it is a complete mystery as to what happened to Wolf and the three rescuers. Perhaps they were caught in a snowstorm or a nasty avalanche. Maybe it was a simple matter of slipping and falling. Who knows? But nonetheless, one thing is very sure. The four men had perished in a place that they had put their all into. By no means was Wolf an experienced climber. He had climbed the mountain off of purely buying himself in and wanting to impress his ex-wife. But he had followed the great Pasong Lama and Weisner to Base Camp 8, an entire 7,700 meters into the sky, a feat that even most climbers nowadays severely struggle to accomplish. And for the Sherpa that most people won't know the name of, they had shown great concern for the stranded wolf. So much concern that they climbed seven camps back up the mountain again to save Wolf. The men who attempted to climb the world's most dangerous mountain in 1939 showed the rest of history that human intervention is possible, even atop such a beast as K2. And while Weisner didn't exactly get to the top, if he had just taken the bottleneck route, he might have been able to achieve history many years early. But I'm going to have to stop this right here. Because while the story of Weisner and his group atop K2 is one that should be remembered, it is not by any means a standout or particularly isolated case of tragedy among K2. K2 is a relentless beast that treats all members with similar dread. There are a plethora of tragic events among the K2 timeline that all deserve respect due, for all those people that have put their life into this mountain. But there are a few cases of true and utmost tragedy, cases that truly do stand out among the timeline of events. Fast forward an entire 47 years since the 1939 disaster, and a lot has happened. A French team in 1954 completed the first summit with a relatively safe ascent, and K2 had gained a lot of attention in the coming years after it was first summited. Some other teams had actually summited K2 from other routes and sides of the mountains, which was previously unheard of. And while some casualties had ultimately happened throughout the years, K2 was a relatively quiet mountain. So in 1986, in the summer season from June 21st to August 10th, it felt like a relatively normal season to summit K2. 
But akin to the disaster of 1939, normal would be the last thing K2 is capable of. In 1986, the government of Pakistan granted an unprecedented number of climbing permits for K2, allowing almost 66 people to attempt to summit K2 that summer. Since K2 had been active in the past few decades, a lot of the routes had been climbed by many different teams hoping to put their name on the mountain's history. But by far the most coveted prize on K2 this year was its unclimbed South Pillar, known as the last great problem that was nicknamed the Magic Line. The Magic Line demanded more steep technical climbing at high altitude, more than anything previously done at the time. There were an entire 10 teams attempting K2 that summer. One of the teams that year was an American expedition under the leadership of John Smolich. On June 21st, John Smolich and his partner Alan Pennington were climbing an easy approach goalie at the base of the route. When far above them, they noticed that the sun had loosened a truck-sized rock from the ice, sending it careening down the mountainside striking the very top of the goalie they were climbing. And as soon as it struck, a 15-foot deep fracture line shot across the low angle slope, triggering a massive avalanche that engulfed both men in seconds. Climbers who witnessed the slide moved quickly and located and dug out Pennington, but it was unfortunately not in time to save his life. Allen had been taken by the mountains. Malich's body, still buried under tons of avalanche debris, was completely unfindable and too dangerous to look for. Smolich was never found. The surviving members of this American team called off their climb and went home. But the other expeditions on the mountain regarded the tragedy just as a freak accident, simply a matter of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, and didn't call off their expensive climb to K2. So just two days later on June 23rd, Maria Brego and Josema Casimiro, and four members of a French Polish expedition, Maurice Berard and Lillian Berard, Wanda Rukiewicz and Michael Parmentier, reached the summit of K2 via the Abruzzi Spur. Rukiewicz and Lillian Berard thereby became the first woman to stand on top of K2 in history, and they did so without even using bottled oxygen. This was history, however, their celebration would be cut short when they were forced by darkness to bivouac high on the summit pyramid. Bivouacking happens when you're forced to make a temporary camp without shelter. It's essentially just finding the best spot to lay down your sleeping bag right where you are. But for this team, they were atop the world's most dangerous mountain. Fortunately, they had survived the night, but by the morning, the clear skies had given way to a horrible storm, and during the descent in said storm, two people had dropped behind the group and never reappeared again. Parmentier guessed that they had fallen or been swept away by an avalanche, but he nonetheless stopped to wait for them in a high camp, while the others who had developed some severe frostbite had descended down. That night, on the 24th, the storm worsened a lot, which woke up Parmentier to a complete whiteout and vicious winds. He radioed base camp by walkie-talkie that he was going to descend, but with the ropes and all the traces of his friend's foot footprints buried by fresh snow, Parmentier became entirely lost on the mountain of K2, 8,000 meters in the sky. He staggered around in the blizzard at 8,000 meters with no idea of where to go, muttering into the radio, Grande Vide, Grande Vide, which translates to a horrifying big emptiness. As he radioed his group getting guided down by the walkie-talkie, he was exhausted and entirely fatigued. But through a miracle of luck, finally, Parmentier found a sign of location, a dome of ice with a urine stain on it, something that the team below had somehow managed to remember. And with pure luck, by this insignificant landmark, they could guide him down the rest of the route by voice. Parmentier was saved by an actual miracle and returned home, but the other two climbers that got lost atop K2 were never seen again. But a week later on July 4th, some more action occurred, this time on the south face of K2 near the Magic Line, where the Polish men Jerzy Kakuksa and Tadu Pietrowski started up the center of this unclimbed wall in light, impeccably pure style, hellbent on pushing the limits of climbing to a new plane. Kakuksa was on a mission, a mission to be the first person to climb all all 14 8,000 meter peaks in the world. But he was in a race with Mesner, another man who was just as hellbent on getting to the 14 peaks title first. Just before sunset on July 8th, after a lot of extreme technical climbing in four rough force bivouac situations, Kukuksa and Petrowski struggled to the summit in a howling storm. They immediately began to descend the Abruzzi Spur. However, Petrowski had unstable gear because of his frostbite that made it hard for him to put on his gear correctly. Ultimately, this led to him stumbling due to lack of gear control, and in an attempt to stay upright, Right, he wrenched his ice axe out of his hands, and he was soon hurtling down the steepening slope, out of control, and Kukuksa could do nothing but watch helplessly as his partner bounced off some rocks and disappeared into the clouds. By now, the summer's death toll was beginning to make some of the climbers on the mountain hesitate climbing, but for many, the lure of the summit proved stronger. Shortly after Kukuksa returned to base camp to tell his grim tale, the renowned Italian solo climber Renato Casarato embarked on his third attempt that summer to climb the magic line. This would be, quote, the last time as he promised 
promise to his wife. Casarado was known as a very cautious, calculating, and skilled climber. And on July 16th, when Casarado was only a thousand feet below the summit, he wasn't liking the look of the weather. So from just that alone, Casarado abandoned his attempt to climb K2, and descended the entire south pillar to the base. But as Casarado made his way to base camp, other climbers watched through binoculars from camp in some paws in front of a narrow crevice, preparing to hop across it. And to their horror, the soft snow at the edge of the crevice gave way and he suddenly disappeared, plunging 120 feet into the bowels of the glacier. From a miracle, he was alive, but badly injured and pleaded for help to his wife through his walkie-talkie. A rescue party ensued and carefully got Casarado out of the crevice after an all-night struggle. But finally, being back up on the surface of the ice, Casarado stood up, took a few steps, laid down, and then died. Roughly a week later, a team entered the range to attempt K2, a team that had no interest in climbing K2 in a rough or new way. The Koreans cared little about how they managed to get to the top, as long as they did it. And being nationally sponsored by South Korea, they used everything they could. They hired 450 porters to haul a small mountain of gear and supplies to base camp, and then methodically proceeded to string miles of fixed rope and chain of well-stocked camps up the Abruzzi Spur. Late in the day of August 3rd, in perfect weather, three of the Koreans reached the summit using bottled oxygen. And after after starting their descent back down the mountain, they were overtaken by two exhausted Polish and a Czech who were using siege tactics and no oxygen to climb the magic line. After watching them pass, they realized that the men who had passed them had just succeeded in making the first ascent of the coveted magic line. So, in nature of being so close to each other, both parties descended together into the night. And as they descended into the night, a famous Polish alpinist had his attention dullied by hypoxia and fatigue and accidentally fell off the end of a fixed rope into the dark, marking the seventh casualty of the season. The next day, Muhammad Ali, a Pakistani porter ferrying loads near the base of the mountain, became victim number eight after he was hit by a falling rock. Multiple days later, the Europeans and Americans were conflicted with the way that the Koreans made their way up the Abruzzi Spur, claiming it removed the ethics of climbing K2 seriously and that it was too gear-heavy and had no concern for the ethics of the region. But as the season was coming to an end, and the mountains started to rumble, even they were not above using the ropes, ladders, and tents fixed by the Koreans to climb the mountain. As multiple teams were moving in their own directions at this time, shifting and joining with each other to ultimately assure their top of the mountain, the weather was about to change. There were great plumes of clouds blowing in from the south, and it became obvious that major bad weather was on the way. Everyone must have been aware that they were taking a great risk by pressing on, but I think when the summit of K2 is within reach, you might be inclined to take a few more chances. Alan Rouse, one of England's most accomplished climbers, and Dobroslawa Wolf, a Polish woman, were the first to start up the summit pyramid. However, Wolf had quickly dropped back due to being tired. Eventually, Rouse met up with Austrian Kurt Diemberger and English woman Julie Tulis. Between the two climbers, Diemberger and Tulis, climbing K2 together was a dream that had consumed the two of them for years. But because of the late hour and the rapidly deteriorating weather, Rouse tried to persuade Diemberger and Tulis to forget about the summit and head down. But as Diemberger said, I was convinced it was better to finally try it after all these years. And Julie too said, Yes, I think we should go on. There was a risk, but climbing is about justifiable risks. At 7pm, when Diemberger and Tulis got to the summit, that risk appeared to have been justified. They hugged each other, and Tulis yelled, Kurt, our dream is finally fulfilled. K2 is now ours. However, almost immediately after leaving the summit, Tulis, who was above Diemberger, slipped. For a fraction of a second, I thought I could hold us, but then we both started sliding down the steep slope, which led to a huge ice cliff. I thought, my god, this is it, this is the end. They had reminded them themselves of the many people who had died in the weeks prior to them, and they both thought, the same thing, the same thing is happening to us. But somehow, miraculously, they managed to stop before shooting over the edge of the ice cliff. They had been saved. But fearing another fall in the dark, instead of continuing down, they simply hacked out a shallow hollow in the snow and spent the remainder of the night there, at 8,200 meters on the top of K2, shivering together in the open snow. They survived the night, but in the morning, the storm was upon them. Tulis had developed frostbite on her nose and fingers, and she was having problems with her eyesight, possibly indicating cerebral edema. But they had survived the night, so they trekked down the mountain. And by noon, when they reached the tents of Camp 4 in the company of their five fellow climbers, they thought the worst was behind them. And as the day progressed, the storm worsened, generating insane amounts of snow, winds in excess of 100 miles per hour, and sub-zero temperatures. Summary time on Monday the 4th. Alan, Maruka, and now on the mountain. 
on the sixth day. Kurt and Julie are on the mountain to the seventh. I honestly don't know where the three Austrians, how long they've been there, but what I do know is that the three Austrians have spent four nights above 8,000 meters. And my doubts and worries over the next couple of days the fate of the, the seven up there are just enormous. The tent the Emberger and Tulis were in had collapsed under the brunt of the storm, though they crowded into Rouse and Wolf's tent. But unfortunately, due to the nature of the storm, sometime during the night of August 6th, while the storm continued to build, the combined effects of the cold, the altitude, Tulis's fall, and the forced overnight stay atop of the mountain, it had all caught up to her. And she died. In the morning, when Diemberger learned of her death, he was devastated. But later that day, furthermore, the six survivors used up the last of both their food and fuel. They could no longer melt snow for water or eat any food. Now they were forced to descend over the next three days in the storm. And as their blood thickened and their strength drained away, they started to go out of it. We reached the stage where it is hard to tell dreams from reality. Diemberger, drifting in and out of bizarre hallucinations, watched Rouse go downhill much faster than the rest of them, and sink into a state of constant delirium. Rouse recalls that Diemberger could speak only of water, but there wasn't any, not even a drop, and the snow they were trying to eat was so cold and dry it barely melted in their mouths. And on the morning of August 10th, after five days of non-stop storm, the temperature dropped to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and the wind continued to blow as hard as ever. But luckily, the snow had stopped falling and the sky had cleared, and those who were able to still think clearly realized that if they didn't make their move right then and there, they weren't going to have enough strength left to make a move at all. So everyone in the group but Rouse had left to base camp because there was no chance of getting Rouse down the mountain, not in his comatose state. So they made Rouse as comfortable as they possibly could to ease his worry, and left him in his tent. Nobody would have any hope of ever seeing Rouse ever again. But in the current state on K2, it was now a case of every man for himself. Within just a few hundred feet of leaving camp, two of the members, Weiser and Emitzer, collapsed from the effort of struggling through the waist-deep snow. We tried in vain to stir them, says Diemberger. Only Emitzer reacted at all. Weakly, he murmured that he couldn't see anything. Weiser and Emitzer were left where they laid. The other three kept fighting their way down. A few hours later, Wolf had dropped behind and never reappeared. Diemberger believes that she fell after inadvertently becoming unclipped from one of the fixed ropes, and the team was now down to two members. Bauer and Diemberger made it to Camp 3 at 24,000 feet, only to find that it had been destroyed by an avalanche. They pressed on towards Camp 2, in the dark of night where they would find food and shelter, then press on to base camp. Late the next night, Bauer, alone without Diemberger, horribly frostbitten and barely alive, finally staggered into base camp looking like an apparition. Unable to speak properly, he nonetheless managed to communicate that Diemberger too was still alive somewhere on the mountain, and Jim Curran and two Polish climbers immediately set out to look for him. Miraculously, they found him, in the middle of the night, crawling down the ropes between Camp 2 and Advanced Base Camp. They found him desperately crawling towards the base of the mountain. But they had finally managed to get him to base camp, from where, on August 16th, Diemberger and Bauer, the only two survivors, were carried out by helicopter, to a hospital in which they miraculously survived after multiple amputations due to frostbite. The Gilkey Memorial is a collection of all of the people who have passed on K2 throughout its history. When Art Gilkey's team gathered stones together to honor their heroic friend's death by avalanche in 1953, a morbid tradition was started. Now, all of the people that have passed due to varying things on K2 lay near the Gilkey Memorial. And to keep the campsite sanitary and clean, climbers started to use the Gilkey Memorial as a place to dispose of all the fingers, bones, arms, legs, heads, and bodies found in the glacial melt. In their eyes, burying these scraps of body was better and felt more respectful than leaving it to the ravens. Climbers that attempt K2 visit the Gilkey Memorial before they climb to remind themselves of what they are getting themselves into. On cold days, it is quiet, and on hot days, the mound of rocks stew with the scent of defrosting flesh, and that odor clings to the climbers' and mourners' hair and clothing. The memorial acts as a barbaric reminder that climbing K2 is no joke, and that corpses rarely make it down the mountain in one piece. Gilkey and the 90 others that lay here peacefully today were all intense stories of struggle, perseverance, heroism, hard work, 
passion, and death. Some more remembered than others, and some forgotten as easily as they disappeared. But nonetheless, the people who died and the people who survived lay as an example of collective effort. They lay as an example of true and utter perseverance in the face of a beast. They lay as an example of pushing limits of discovery just a little bit further. And they will continue to push them. But K2 won't change for us, because K2 is not a savage mountain any more than Everest is a killer peak. K2 is an inert mass of rock, ice, storm, and snow. As you watch this video, the winds will howl around the Abruzzi Ridge, the crevices and glaciers will crack and shift, and the mountain will be choked by its own debris. But K2 for now is harmless, for nobody is there. But humans, as ambitious as they are fallible, will return to K2's bleak and harsh abyss with their own self-imposed challenges. And all I do is pray that they heed the mountain's history. Thank you.